Bride of Frankenstein. Ah, great movie. Oh, hello. Uh, welcome to the film vault of Front Row. I'm Rich Scrivani. We've outdone ourselves today because waiting for us upstairs are the three authors of a book that's become required reading for fans of the most popular horror films of the 30s and 40s. The book, Universal Horrors. And our guests, brothers John and Michael Brunus and Tom Weaver. I think they're ready, so I'll just put this aside and go join them. Oh, you're coming too, aren't you? Come on, sit in the front row. The book is Universal Horrors, and with us today are the three authors of the book. T right here, John Brunus, Tom Weaver, Mike Brunus. What were your childhood influences? What got you into, since we're discussing the book, the Universal Horror films? What was it that really introduced you to them? I guess when I was around seven or eight years old, I developed an interest in science fiction horror films. Uh, seen films like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and uh, It Came From Beneath the Sea, which was a Harry Harryhausen special effects film, uh, whetted my interest in the subject. I was interested in dinosaurs as a kid and far out stuff. And uh, our parents were very good about it. They took us to see movies like Rodan, <laughs> films like uh, Horror Dracula, which really scared the heck out of us. And uh, one summer day in 1958, my cousin Bobby came over for the week. And he lived in Bergenfield, and he was very close to us. He was like a third brother. He came over and he said, you, know, you guys are interested in horror and science fiction. Do you know there was a sh there's a show on every night that shows these movies? And uh, it's called Shock Theater. And they show Frankensteins and Draculas and Wolfman movies. And we thought, they said, that sounded great. But it was on late. And, but luckily, we were on a summer vacation, so we were allowed to stay up and watch it once or twice. I remember Bobby telling us about a, uh, a movie called The Mummy's Tomb, which made it sound very interesting. And then he drew in a title uh, like Mystery of the White Room, which uh, in retrospect, it's not a horror film. It was in the shock theater package, mm. but it had mystery and chiller elements. In any case, it took a few months for me to get my courage up. I was nine at the time, and my brother was, he was still young, he was like six, to stay up and watch shock theater. And, uh, that summer, as I said, Horror Dracula scared us, and we kind of shied away from horror films. But I figured this is going to be safe. It's going to be on TV. It's going to be in, in our room watching it. And the title that was on at this particular Saturday night in September was uh, Man Made Monster. The poster's right here. Mm -hmm. And um, I planned my whole schedule that night, uh, making a list of the shows I would watch just before Man Made Monster was going to start at, uh, I think, 11.15 or so. And the film came on, and I got through the first 20 minutes of it. Now, nothing really happens in the first 20 minutes of this <laughs> film. Uh, it's about a, a Lon Chaney Jr. plays uh, the survivor of a, a, a bus crash, who it's discovered later that he is immune to electricity. And he falls into the clutches of a mad scientist, played by Lionel Atwell, and he's used as his guinea pig. In any case, Chaney develops this power to, if he touches a, a, like a cocktail table, like this sparks will come out from between his fingers. Mm. Well, they show the scene where Chaney discovers he's got this power, and he puts his hand in a fish tank, and he kills the fish. That was enough for me. I said, that's <laughs> it. I'm going to bed. I turned the set off. And it took me a while to get back to Shock Theater. And, uh, and after that, every week, you know, I would say, you know, should I stay up and watch it? Will I be afraid? And I remember the second week they showed a, um, a Lugosi, early Bella Lugosi film called Night of Terror. And my cousin Bobby was staying over that week. And I said, Bobby, let's stay up together. Maybe I can get through this. Well, courage. Right? Courage, yeah. courage. And, uh, and then one week after the other, we started watching it and then became hooked. That was it. Uh, that basically, it became a. It, it was in your blood after that. Yeah, 58, 1958 was the turning point. Yeah. Well, 1958 was a big year for these guys. It was a big year for me too, because that's the year I was born. <laughs> and sometimes I, I feel a little, um, I'm, I'm feel a feeling of having missed out by not being a few years older and going through 
what these guys went through and a lot of other people talk about very nostalgically. But in a way, when I grew up, it was just as good. It was in the mid-60s when I first discovered monsters, and that was a time of just complete inundation. Um, you could turn on the TV like any hour of the day and night in New York, and there'd be something on, an old movie and Twilight Zone and repeats in the afternoon and Outer Limits and famous monsters on the newsstand and Monster World and Castle of Frankenstein. I just, it was just complete completely swamped by monsters growing up in the mid-60s, the Aurora model kits, all that stuff. And about the only thing I wasn't exposed to was the Universals, because they weren't on New York TV at that time when I first started getting really interested. But for some reason, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein was. And when Dracula opened up that crate and he had the little gizmo, they applied to the monster's electrodes and started them up. And I, I always thought that he, Dracula, created the monster. I thought that was, because I knew there were monster rally movies from famous monsters, etc. And that gave me the impression that Dracula created Frankenstein. And for some reason, I guess I'd seen The Wizard of Oz, too, because I thought the monster was made out of hay because the box was full of hay. <laughs> Silly boy. So, <laughs> actually, that's I was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, actually, that's pretty logical when you think about it. I mean, you know, that's, it's that, that's the first thing you saw. But one thing I thought of is we, the Brunuses and myself, were at an age where horror films were sort of taboo, and they were shown late at night, and it was like... Uh, uh, it was something kind of, uh, you know, do you dare watch this? That was part of the allure of it. Yeah, it was, right, exactly. And by the time you got around to it, they were, I, By the you time know, I got home from school, I could turn on the TV and catch Return of the Ape Man or, or any Twilight Zone or anything. Yeah, so you, so you just liked them because you, you know, it was, it was you were, like you say, inundated. Yeah, it was we, the big thing. I'd go into a toy store and everything would be monster-related, Adam's Family or the Munsters and the just Aurora model kits. There was nowhere a kid could turn yeah. in 1965, 66, when I was getting interested that he didn't bump into monsters. How did you decide to collaborate on a book? Whose idea was it and who? Well, I think it was a long overdue idea to begin with, as you said. As a matter of fact, John and I were interested in writing a, this book several years before we actually did it. And we did approach a few publishers who, strangely enough, were very cool to the idea. You got to remember, this was in the late 80s? No, and, no, uh, the, late, <clears throat> the late 70s. But yeah, and uh, horror film scholarship isn't what it is today. Now you go to any Barnes & Noble, any bookstore, and there are horror books all over the place. Mm. And uh, it seemed a natural thing that there should be uh, some sort of book where it describes all these the, the classic universal horror films in some detail, in some depth. But uh, none of the publishers seemed uh, interested, and uh, the, like, the idea kicked around a bit, and then we finally approached McFarlane, and they didn't jump on the idea initially either. They thought uh, covering, like, 90 films was a bit too much and then they asked for a revised version a, a, a scaled down version then we, we submitted a, a scaled down proposal and they said well if you're going to cover some of these films you might, you might cover all these films you might want to add that we first got the idea in the late 70s and approached major publishers and they well, told us they were oh, interested. that early. That okay. early. It took almost 10 years later that we got the idea going again, thanks to Tom here. As a matter, as a matter of fact, uh -huh. we were going to do a book of uh, the films of Vincent Price uh, because Citadel was putting out their series of the, um, yeah. the films of Cary oh, Grant, the right. films of Boris Karloff even. Right. And uh, we decided to do the films of Vincent Price. And then, uh, the, then when McFarlane became interested, we changed gears once again and, and focused our attention to the Universal book which is what we wanted to do in the first place, because we had a great deal of affection for these movies from yeah, way back. Now you said 90 titles. Were you, t were you thinking of doing beyond the years you covered? Was it no, 90 titles? No, there's about 90 in there. Yeah, it yeah, is. There's about 85. There are? Yeah, oh, yeah. I've, I got in my head 52 titles because no. of the shock no, theater no, package. Which well, is, yeah, we, 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 we call I, them, I didn't, 90 titles. We call them horror films, but mm -hmm. actually it, it's, uh, we use a, pr a pretty broad definition of horror. We include all the Sherlock Holmes movies in there. <coughs> Just because I think Bowser Rathbone's association with the genre uh, pretty much sticks, uh, pretty much sticks. Yeah. So we include that, those in there also, that as well as a number of fantasies, a couple of uh, murder mysteries with horror elements and uh, comedies with supernatural overtones, that right. sort of thing. So when you cover, include all these kind of titles, you have a very long book at the end of the process. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. that's uh, that what covers. What? Every once in a great while, MCA Universal lets me have some tiny little hand in helping them decide what to put out on tape and laser disc. And at one point, a couple of years ago, they said to me that they were putting out a new batch of horror movies, and 
oh, I think Night Monster was going to be in there and a couple of others. And they said, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. And I said, The Mystery of Edwin Drood? I said, you know, it's an okay, it's a good movie and all. You put it out if you want, but don't put it out as part of the monster package with, you know, the Wolfman's picture on the box. It's not a, a horror <laughs> film. It's, it's, that's just ridiculous. And, and the lady said, really? Really? I should go tell the video people. I said, yeah, do that. And I even, after I got off the phone, I went to one of my books. And I looked it up in one of my books that would have a short synopsis, and the, the synopsis was a choir master falls in love with a young girl named Rosa Bud. And I Xeroxed that, and I faxed it to her, and I wrote on it, this is not a horror film. Do not release as part of the Universal Monsters package. And she called me back about two days later, kind of a little bit of annoyance in her voice. She said, I went down there, and I told them all you said. And the guy went over to a shelf, and he pulled down a book called Universal Horrors with your name on it, and it's in there. <laughs> so they're releasing it. Get off my back. <laughs> well, to be fair, it was part of the shock package, and it has creepy gothic elements mm -hmm. but I just didn't think it should be part of the uh, the, the classic well, monster you're, you're collection yeah, you're mm -hmm. you should release a Dickens pa pa <laughs> yeah. Yeah. exactly but, yeah, right. uh, well these films get associated with the horror genre even though they're not horror movies per se so uh, the thing is if a customer or a reader wanted to uh, find a title like that in such a book, uh, they'd be very disappointed if, it, if they weren't there. Yeah. So we want a book that will make everybody happy, basically. Since we're talking about the films, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, the uh, legacy these films have. You know, they're, I think it's fair to say they're at least as popular and more so in maybe a different way today than, than maybe they were then. What, what I wanted to veer off into, though, as far as the, endur the enduring quality of the films, were some of the influences like from brought over from Europe of some of the directors, some of the writers, maybe? I mean, weren't there? Uh, this is this is the stuff that got lost in the '40s. That that uh, that look of art, if you want to call it that. I mean, w wouldn't you say that would have something to do with the the esteem they're held in? Uh, Partly. Well, part of the reason, I guess, is because the guys from Europe in the '20s were the people who made some of these pictures, mm -hmm. like Carl Freund, etc. And then people like James Whale took a lot of their ideas from movies like Cabin of Dr. Caligari and even um, the, the, Golem. the Golem, The Magician, which I just saw, a silent film, which I just saw for the first time very recently. And That's Dr. Right, Frankenstein's yeah. Lab is, is right there in this 1926 silent. Yeah. And um, yeah, very much, very much influenced by those movies. Yeah, let's talk a little about James Whale. Uh, was there, first of all, was, was there anybody else in that era, uh, director-wise, who could touch him? Who could uh, in the horror film realm? I think uh, so. yeah, yeah. Probably. Uh, uh, Ruben Mamoyan did a version of Jekyll and Hyde uh, in 1931, and it was beautifully made. Uh, well, the Europeans had a natural sensibility towards the horror film because uh, it, uh, the Americans tend to look down on the genre. The Europeans didn't, and I think the Europeans saw the uh, the stylistic possibilities of a horror film. Uh, well, the the Americans just sort of had a very condescending attitude towards it, hmm. which is why all the best horror films were made by, most of them are made by European directors. Yeah. Although Todd Browning was American. Yeah. Well, it's funny, James Whale uh, may only made Frankenstein because he became so associated with uh, political type of films. He made, he had a, a well, smashing, su films. Yeah, smashing mm -hmm. success with Journey's End, which was a sort of an anti-war film about World War I. And he became so identified with that, he wanted to get as far away from him as possible, oh. which made him to, uh, to uh, embark on doing a film version of Frankenstein, which Universal had on the, on the boards already. Yeah. And uh, it is uh, very ironic that he became more associated with horror than war films after, after this, and he wanted to shake his hands of that genre as well. So he, he, it was in a no-win situation. Yeah, which didn't make him happy, I know. Do you think... Um, We'll get back to James Whale in a second, but you're in a th movie theater in 1931, 1932, and these, one of these things comes on. What do you suppose an audience's reaction was, besides all the, the forgetting about all the publicity of nurses in attendance and people fainting and screaming, what would be the equivalent today of, uh, I used to think maybe The Exorcist or something, of course that's in the 70s, but what would the effect have been? Do you think they were really that frightening back then when they came out? Yeah, the original Dracula and at least the first half of it, most of Frankenstein, uh, the mummy, there was, it was a different kind of horror. It wasn't, you know, in-your-face horror. It was atmosphere, chills, eeriness. I recently showed the original Frankenstein to the son of uh, friends of ours, and uh, he, he kind of got into it. But I was looking at the film through his eyes. He was, uh, he was 15 years old. Make me believe I was watching for the first time. And this kid knows Freddy Krueger and all the, uh, the, the, the contemporary horror stuff. 
And the film was actually frightening me. Uh, hmm. It's so primitive and so eerie and so stark and black and white and... Uh, no music. No music. Mm -hmm. And the first, the opening reels of Dracula are, are, are very frightening, or scary, mm -hmm. or creepy. creepy. Yeah, frightening that, that, yeah. isn't, isn't yeah. the right word. I mean, they yeah. don't, you don't jolt, yeah. you know, both from your seat type There's of There's an horror, oddness, you know? like, right? Thank you, an oddness. And the fact that they're so old and that antique feeling. Mm -hmm. I know you feel that way about them. Well, so, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that lends to the aura of uh, creepiness. You, yeah. have, you have to recall, you have to remember that horror films were almost novelties back then. Uh, the kids nowadays watch horror films uh, right, right from when they were very young. But in those days, when the studio made a horror film, it was almost a special event. Uh, the real staple for the for kids watching these movies were westerns, mm -hmm. and they were westerns made by the score. And uh, now, uh, now everything is sort of flip flop. There are no westerns being made, but there are horror pictures all over the place. Yeah. And that's why they were so scary, because uh, there weren't that many made. Uh, it's hard to scare a kid these days, because uh, they're sort of brought up from horror from uh, the day they uh, leave the cradle. My name is Conrad Brooks. You're watching the front row, and you're going to enjoy it very much. And I'm Conrad Brooks, who appeared in the worst motion picture of all times. But after all these years, it's probably the best by now. Plan 9 from Matter Space. It's the most outstanding cast in a most outrageous movie. I did that, baby. Debbie Rashawn. You shut up. Trent Haga. Is that it? Michael R. Thomas. Wonderful. Nathan Sears. And I'm so confused. Conrad Brooks. I hope you're paying attention. Zachary Lee. <laughs> and many more. In a film co written by Brink Stevens. How are you? <laughs> Dr. Horror's Erotic House of Idiots. <laughs> Cult Radio Agogo calls Dr. Horror a front-of-the-line pass to a fun house of genre pals and childhood memories for every monster kid. Of course. Micro Cinema Fest awarded Debbie Rashan and Trent Haga Best Actress and Actor in a Comedy. Now we're cooking. And TheMonsterClub.com calls Dr. Horror's Erotic House of Idiots their Movie of the Year. How lucky I am. Dr. Horror's Erotic. House of Idiots? Why, you? A special three hour DVD spectacular. I think I see your point. Well, James Whale, I mean, we're talking basically, since we're talking about the book, contributed four to the genre, really Frankenstein, Old Dark House, Invisible Man, and Bride of Frankenstein. And, uh, isn't it true that by, that he wanted nothing to do with a sequel to Frankenstein? He, wanted, he didn't want to touch it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He was contractually obligated to, to do it. Yeah. Uh, well, well, the thing is, uh, uh, speaking about horror films, I think uh, Whale uh, saw Frankenstein as a as the way of uh, presenting a real scary film. But Whale knew that uh, a second Frankenstein would not scare anybody. So when he made the sequel to Brother Frankenstein, he turned it into sort of a Baroque comedy where the horror elements are very much downplayed and the film became sort of a, 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 a lampoon of the whole genre. He was playing with it, I think. Yeah. He didn't want to make this film. He didn't want to make another horror film. He was very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And he turned, he was having his own, it was like a, being in a toy store and he was trying to understand how much he could get past the studio heads and he was very sly. and. He, he didn't think that the, the second film would uh, be nearly as good as the original. Of course, we know now that uh, the sequel, uh, in, in the eyes of most people, is a much yeah. better film. Yeah. In, 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 in the view of, in the eyes of most people, not me. In a popular sense, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. It's a much Absolutely. different film. It's almost like a fantasy as opposed to the first film. Yeah, like a fairy tale. Sort of yeah, like. the first, yeah. But he right. had, it, 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 was, it had so much style, and there was so much to soak up in that movie that I'm surprised he didn't realize it might be... Uh, a big hit, but I guess... I think he was proud of it once once he completed it. Yeah. I think he really was. It turned out a lot better than he, than he thought it would. Because he kept investing more and more of his own personal, you know, uh, style and traits into the film. Mm -hmm. yeah. And The Invisible Man, uh, he did want to make that, didn't he? Or was he yeah, oh yeah, that was considered an A production from right. the start to last. Yeah. Well, A. Like Universal's Universal idea of an A, yeah. exactly, is yeah. not the same as a real A picture, but they well, did they the best really they could. They good writers on that. Mm -hmm. Aussie oh, Sharer. Yep. It was a very high-budgeted high film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the only other thing is old, the, uh, the Old Dark House, which was the second. 
for Universal Horror Film, yeah. sort of horror film. Uh, that he. You mean really, second for him? For him, right? Yeah. His second. Or, yeah. That he really. That was something he wanted to make. Yeah. Well, I that think, was a. Right. That wasn't even a horror film. I mean, it was uh, just a. a, a uh, an exercise in the characters, an uh, odd, bizarre characterization. There again, uh, this, the novel from which it was based is called Benighted, which is very much a straightforward, almost existential thriller. And what is, Whale takes the exact same plot, most of the dialogue, but he turns the whole thing on its ear and turns it into a comedy. It's very remarkable mm -hmm. because it's so faithful to the novel, but on the other hand, it's so different. Mm -hmm. It shows you what an interesting director he was. Yeah, I th now that's a film, I think you'll all agree with this, that, that I've found I like the more I see it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Definitely. You know, I Definitely. mean, at first, I, I have to admit to being a a tad, not let down, but it, not, it's not as much of a horror film as well, I thought it was uh, going to be. famous you know? monks's fault. Yeah, mm -hmm. the pictures of Carlo. Yeah. yeah. Old Dark House is sort of like those old silent cat in the canary and the monster sure. with Lon Chaney. That's, it's a spooky house and all sorts of crazy characters, but... There's a lot of comedy in it too. He yeah. just took that and made the best that sort of formula, and took the book Benighted and mixed it all together and made the best film of that type ever. Yeah, it, didn't, it didn't make much money because yeah. all the people, uh, uh, the audiences back in '31 were just as befuddled with it as, as you are <laughs> apparently. <laughs> because it was always very British, and I don't think mm -hmm. it appealed much to an American audience. It mm -hmm. had a very British attitude and very yeah. British kind of humor. It got yeah. very good re contemporary reviews. Yeah, excellent. I don't think the American cast were too uh, thrilled with the British element of it either. Right? No. Yeah. <laughs> they felt like fish out of water. Yeah. Gloria Stewart. Yeah, yeah. So that they she, was, didn't mix. she and Melvin Douglas were the only Americans in a cast. And yeah, they got sort of frozen out by the stuffy Brits that were in it. <laughs> a little <laughs> bit socially, anyway. Boris Car you, should, you should mention who was in it. Boris Karloff, Charles mm -hmm. Lawton, Ernest Tessinger. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. more. Yeah. The... Uh, Oh, and classic. even more, since you mentioned her, what was she to Lawrence Olivier again? Was, wasn't she? Mother-in-law. Mother mother she's his mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. okay. How would you like to have that for a mother-in-law? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the only other thing I have to say about the old dark house was, uh, was that it, uh, I o always thought that that was the first of the, the roads washed out, we got to stay here for the night movies, but apparently it wasn't. I mean, it was a long line of those things, oh, probably. Mm -hmm. the, silent the silent days, yeah. Probably yeah. the one real <laughs> thing mm -hmm. made in the previous to 1911. Right. Yeah. So I erroneously would always say, this is the original movie where the road washes <laughs> out and they have to have to stay here for the night. Well, that was, was always the a selling point. Films yeah. of the sound era. One yeah. of them. Yeah. Okay. Now, to get back to somebody we mentioned before, one, one thing that uh, struck me when I read this book was... Uh, do, do you mind if I point out who did which chapters, or would you rather keep it all anonymous? No. Yeah. Do what you have to do. Okay. Well, I happen to know Dracula was your chapter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it Most was. Infamous chapter in yeah. the book. I didn't mm -hmm. know when I was reading the book, of course, because mm -hmm. I didn't really know you then. But uh, I was really struck by, I was reading your, your honesty mm -hmm. about things that, had, that you wrote that hadn't been written before about, uh, hey, this, this movie really all it's cracked up to be? I mean, it's, it's an acknowledged classic, mm -hmm. but it, it, it does creak at the seams, and it's slow, and it's stagey, and all this, and it hadn't really, nobody really had the nerve to come out and put it in writing as explicitly and as in much detail as you did. Yeah, I, one of my principles going into this book was if something, if, if everybody always says A about a picture, let me say B. If everybody says white, let me say black. And it seemed to me that a lot, a lot of people just sort of hinted around the edges that they were decided, they were afraid to say Dracula wasn't a classic. They would say it was a classic and then go off for 25 minutes and tell you what they didn't like about it. <laughs> and uh, it seemed to me it was finally time to really put it on paper and maybe even a little more firmly than, I, maybe just a tad more firmly than I actually believed, just to see if I could draw these people out and make them talk about the book, whether positively or negatively, or talk about that chapter, I should say. Um, at least get people really talking and lay the cards on the table, Dracula-wise. I've got a little bit of a devil's, uh, uh, devil's apprentice. Advocate. Uh, advocate, thank you, devil's apprentice. <laughs> not, not the devil's apprentice. I've got a little bit of a devil's advocate about me when I write these things sometimes, just to get people really talking and lay their cards on the table and really, really get people to talk or think about what they really think about these movies. Because I think a lot of too many people just, re if they read an opinion, of a movie and a book, if they see it in black and white, well, that's the party line. I, I better, I better either stick to that or have a real good reason not to. Not too many people just believe what they read or, or repeat what they read. That uh, changed yeah. a lot because now you can't pick up any book and find anything good to say about Dracula or practically. Everyone says really, it's a creep. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, I didn't it's, know it's, that. I didn't know it would push the pendulum that far yeah. in the direction. <laughs> the film is so. Um, yeah, the film is so uh, 
underrated, it's becoming overrated. Mm -hmm. Also overrated, it's becoming underrated. Well, with, correct me if I'm wrong, but was that the beginning of a reevaluation of Todd Browning's output? Your, this chapter? Or, or well, not too much had been written about Todd Browning, I don't think, before this book. Um, to be honest with you, I don't really know, but I, th I think a lot of people did find the courage after this book and a few others came out kind of bashing Dracula to, 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 either, to either agree with it or fight in favor of Dracula. It really made it a talked about movie instead of a movie that everybody said was a classic and whispered behind the movie's back that they didn't really like it that much. Yeah. I, think it's a good, I think it's a good film. I think uh, it's become very underrated lately. The, the opening reels are, are Beautifully oh, done. Great. That's the, the thing that strikes you: so many missed opportunities. Yeah. You know, like, mm -hmm. look, there's a there's a huge wolf running across the lawn, yeah. and you don't see it. Mm -hmm. But there aren't too many missed opportunities in the first half hour, so it's no. uh, it's about yeah. a, per a perfect horror film as you can think of, yeah, in my view. First half hour, yeah, and then it becomes uh, one lost. Like you said, missed opportunity after another. Yeah. I've got they just filmed the stage play after that. I've got a little nephew that tried to, that actually went out and rented it one night and tried to watch it with a bunch of his friends. And he said just everybody fell asleep except him, and and even he was hating it. And I said to myself, one of the things I said to myself is, if we hold this up to be one of the greats, and kids see it and don't like it, then there won't there's no they won't want to see any other horror films. If this is one mm. of the great mm. oldies, mm -hmm. Wait, are you sure that it's just Dracula these kids didn't like? You know, you suppose no, you no, these were open-minded kids. You mean but if you put on like uh, Frankenstein, Arnold, or Soul, you think they would have gotten into I it? I think they would have, yes. My, well, speaking for my, I don't know his friends. I, speaking for my nephew, right. I know he would have because I show him those kind of things all the time. But he tried to show his friends Dracula because it's got a classic rep and they all hated it. And if we write that Dracula is one of the landmarks, one of the yeah. all-time greats. What incentive is that for young people to watch any more horror movies? But on the other hand, you can't hold uh, your ten-year-olds up for the first time. No, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But you do have to be more honest yeah. in writing about these movies than, than, um, than people used to be. John, Tom, Mike, there's so much more to cover. I just want to thank you for being here. It was a uh, pleasure. Universal Horrors. You can get it through McFarland Press. Thanks everybody for watching Front Row, and we'll see you next time. Yeah. I know what you're thinking. We've only covered half the subject. What about the horrors of the 40s? Not to worry, you've only seen part one of this edition of Front Row. Be with us next time when we'll be discussing the big shakeup at Universal, the films of Lon Chaney Jr., and then some of Tom Weaver's current projects. We'll see you then. It's, it's, that's just ridiculous.